Hello everyone, Nary here from Drake Wing Gaming. So if you know me on Twitter, The Gaming Dragon. Today I'm coming at you with something a little bit different. I'm doing an interview with Sedge, and I've got the man himself right here with me. Say hello, Sedge. Hey, it's me. Been it's... a while since I did one of these. The audience has missed you. They've been talking to me about wanting to get you back in. <laughs> I'm seen. Yep, they definitely sadly, like I've that been... voice. Yeah, sadly I've been pretty busy recently with everything going on. Well, absolutely, you're making a game. <laughs> yeah, then there's also my other job, my life, you know, just... I, I, in general, I just hate having to do the, sa like, the same thing usually every week. It's why I never could, like, hold down a sport or anything else that, like, I need to go back to every week. I'm fickle like that, sadly. Ah, hell, what, do you, what can you do? You are who you are, and we appreciate you for being here today. But yeah, so guys, this is my first interview with a game developer. Um, I don't expect me to cover everything. I'm just, I've got a script prepared. I've got a bunch of questions. Uh, Sedge and I are going to have a bit of a back and forth. You know, when I ask him a question, he can ask me that same question or something different. So this will, this should keep it interesting. So I don't know how long this video will go for. Probably about maybe 30, 40 minutes. Is that all right with you, Sedge? Yeah. Awesome. All right, so the first question. What got you into the visual novel scene? Um, see, this is one of those few questions that I know exactly what the answer is. Uh, I was watch, I was like looking through Furry IRL, the subreddit, because why not? And I saw a whole lot of people posting about Adastra uh, and Amika specifically, because I think by then it was like late 2020, Adastra just finished and people were losing a fucking fit over it. Uh, and I was like, what kind of game is this? Why is everybody losing their mind over this fat wolf? And so I tried it, not even expecting much. Uh, and to my surprise, I actually really liked the game. Uh, even though I didn't like everything about it, I, I definitely understood why people liked it. Let's put it that way. And, uh, and, it, and it was shocking because I, I played other furry visual models before. Um, Nekojishi uh, comes to mind. But none of them had really, like, I never really felt the way that I felt about Astra before um, towards a furry visual novel. And then I discovered that there were more like it. You know, I had another friend whom I talked to about Ad Astra, uh, and he, he got me to try a few other ones. One of which was Far Beyond the World, which you're also covering on your channel. And the other it was Repeat. Uh, and it was especially this last one that really got me into creating uh, furry visual novels because it was just so out there. You know, it's basically furry Jojo. It was so crazy. It, it shouldn't have worked, but it did. And I loved every second of it. Uh, and it got me to thinking, you know, I have a lot of ideas. Like I tried to be a regular writer before. I tried to be the script writer for a comic book that never get, went anywhere. Uh, maybe this is what I've been waiting for, you know? The furry fandom always struck me as this place where art goes and nothing else, really. Like, I tried to make furry novels before and nobody gave a shit, really. Um, but I saw there was a, a big public, or a big community for furry visual novels. And I saw that the combination of novel writing with actual art cause a stir in people, you know, like people actually bother to read the stuff that people wrote if there were, if there was art to go along with it. And right. so I thought, you know what, maybe this is what I've been waiting for, you know? <clears throat> and so the combination of just all these visual novels that I really liked reading and just the general feeling of, you know what, I can do this, but better, uh, debatably so, really got me into, into making it. All right. Well, that, <laughs> wow. That's quite a that's quite a lot to digest there. So, <clears throat> for myself, what got me into the visual novel scene in general, uh, I was I was looking to change up my channel a bit. I hadn't had any success with covering you know first person shooters and retro games and stuff like that. So, I'd never really been that interested in visual novels before. So I started scanning itch.io and I found uh, one that caught my attention about furry psychics, psychic connections. Uh, shout out to Rook, he's an awesome dev as well. <laughs> And I covered wow. that on my channel, and it just fucking exploded. And, well, the rest is history. I've just, I, I have seen a lot of success with my channel. 
pumping out two to three videos a day. I get to play awesome games like No More Future. I get to talk to devs, do interviews with them now like yourself. And hell, I couldn't be happier about the direction this channel is going. And I'm glad to have you for this interview. Yeah, I'm glad for your vision levels to help you as much as they did me. Oh, and uh, so I would like to make a little bit of an announcement, not to hijack the interview. I am actually working on a visual novel with Zara Shro. Ooh. Yep, yep. It is, uh, we first kind of like, spit... As a writer, or...? Ooh. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm going to... I think he and I are, are, are writing it. We're, we're still hashing out details, but uh, the original the original idea was to have, like, a horror romance visual novel, but I'm going to shelve that for now. I'm going to kind of do just, like... I would like to do, like, kind of like a, a, a college... a college kind of gay romance. But, yeah, just... No, no details right now. Just a little, just a little teaser. <laughs> All right, on to question two. What are some of your favorite visual novel games? Hey, Sedge. Uh oh. One second, guys. We may have lost Sedge. Sorry about that, guys. Uh, welcome back. We had a little bit of uh, technical issues going on, but we're back. Uh, Sedge, can you uh, talk and let us know you're here? Yeah, uh, sorry about that. My internet got a little messed up, but now it should be fine. Okay, perfect. All right. So, uh, on, did you say anything about the uh, the, the visual novel I'm uh, that Zerishro and I are uh, talking about creating? or Because uh, you kind of cut out. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, I was saying that it sounds cool. Uh, I'm, it's, it's too early for me to say anything about it, but uh, I'm definitely looking forward to seeing where you, where you go. I haven't seen you write like any of your writing so far, so it'd be interesting to see how you approach the medium. All right. I'm, I'm going to do my best to impress everyone. <laughs> want to make a good impression. But All right, so on to question number two. What are some of your favorite visual novels? Well, like I said earlier, Repeat really uh, defined me going forward. It's what inspired me to start my journey into this medium. Um, but early on, aside from that and Adastra and Far Beyond the World, which later I dropped, sadly, uh, there weren't a lot that re a lot others that really sparked my attention. Um, but lately, things have changed a lot. Uh, I've tried a lot more, and I have to say that right now, my favorite of all time uh, is Remember the Flowers. And I don't say that just because it's another quote-unquote safe work, but not really visual novel. It's just, the plot is just great, you know? Uh, I've read it, I, I've been reading it, uh, I, I think I started right. I, I started reading it uh, in, like, towards the start of a year, maybe? Uh, and at first I thought that, like, the beginning was very slow and stuff, but every update after that, was like was really good like i know you haven't covered it yet on your channel and i don't want to spoil anything for you but i have to say that novel just gets better and better every update and it's definitely my favorite of all time for a reason um then second after that is nevin uh which is a like a quote-unquote dark fantasy kind of novel uh the protagonist is a bard with no magical powers in a world where everyone has them uh, who's trying to win a competition, uh, and yeah, both novels are really solid. Like, even though, especially the latter, um, I, I'm not a fan of the art style for Nevin, but the, but the writing is really solid. Um, and it's the same thing with Remember the Flowers, where you can really tell that the creators are putting a lot of effort into writing their stories. They're not just pandering to an audience. They're not just doing this because, you know, fuck it, let's do it. They're doing it because they care. And you can really tell when somebody cares about what they're doing, about what they're writing, about who they're writing to. Um, and yeah, right now, these are my favorites. Awesome. Okay, so like you were you were How talking about, about... Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, uh, you were saying... Oh, yeah, I was saying, like, so for me, uh, you were talking about Nevin. I actually got approached by the developers, and they asked me to cover their game, and I'm actually planning on doing that very soon. Um, I, I like the look of it, um, and I'm, very, I'm encouraged by it now because you said the writing is strong. That's kind of make or break yeah. with me with visual novels. It has to have good writing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like, to me, from my personal experience, 
The best novels are written by people who are very approachable in regards to criticism. Because um, I have played all these novels on stream, oftentimes with the creators or parts of a dev team present, and you can really tell who writes amazing games by the way that they react to criticism. Because the people who write the best games are often the most respectful when it comes to handling criticism. They, they say, thank you, I, I, I appreciate you saying that. We'll keep that into consideration. And oftentimes, they, I'm not saying that you need to apply every criticism that you get or even consider it, but oftentimes the people who are most open about discussing the flaws of their games instead of just focusing on the good sides uh, without throwing a hissy fit anyway, um, are the ones that really write the best stuff because they were the ones who, who reacted the best to my critics. Uh, and and it shows, like they, their, their novel is just really, really excellently written. And there's nothing you can say about that. I think the, the, the worst thing that I could possibly say about Never, for example, is that the beginning is a little bit slow, but like that's part of it, of course, for, with furry visual novels that I've seen. Um, and so, yeah, that's one thing that I, um, that I can recommend. All right, awesome. Yeah, like I, I do. I don't. I don't mind a slow start. Like, so like when it comes for me, like when it comes to storytelling and like horror movies, for me, I love slow burn. <laughs> as long as there's like the opposite. okay, like for me, as long as there is a good amount of payoff at the end or near the middle or something like that, I, I love the buildup of tension. Mm -hmm. All right. I mean, I'm. I'm not I'm sorry, like saying but... like you you don't have to like I'm fine with with taking it slow if you have something to say basically like if it's just slow for the sake of dragging it out oh no I don't uh, like we, that <laughs> just, yeah I don't I don't mind slow beginnings as long as there's a purpose to them absolutely um, but in general yeah I am a I am a proponent of starting off very strong uh, which is hilarious considering that I kind of don't <laughs> well it depends. Oh, I love the start of I love the start of No More Future. Really? Oh yeah, absolutely. I think it's Would great. Would you classify that as a slow or a, or a fast start? Um, I'd say it's about right in the middle. Hmm. Like I don't think it drags its feet too much. Um, I think it establishes uh the uh, the characters, the situation they're in, and then it then it kind of just hits the ground running from there. Mm hmm. All right. Yeah. On to question number three. All right. Is Isaac's personality based on someone in real life? Or, or like, is he an extension of yourself? Not really. Um, the way that I... Con I, I didn't conceive Isaac to be any particular archetype, basically. Like, the way that I approached Isaac was... I want to write a character who feels believable in their actions. Because one of my my biggest complaints of a lot of visual novels that I read after the quote-unquote golden age that I had at the beginning was that their main characters just made no fucking sense. They would react to things in a completely nonsensical way, just making choices because the plot told them to do it, basically, and not really thinking about what they were doing, not providing any explanation, not providing any emotional reasoning. Uh, and so I wanted to create a character that in their in their choices in their behavior in their needs and desires could be always quote unquote relatable to the audience not in the sense that people can always agree with what he's doing but it always makes sense in a way um and and so the the, the reader would never feel like the main character just did stuff for the sake of doing stuff you know he always had a solid reason for doing everything he did and I'm not sure if that is always the case, but that's what I what I try to do. Okay. Well, I, 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 I will I will add to that. It's when you're talking about stuff that doesn't make sense or is random. It sounds like you were describing a place to call home to a T. I actually never read that one. It. I absolutely love it. It is one of the funniest furry visual novels I've ever played. It is so ridiculously random and stuff just goes off on a tangent. And it feels like a furry visual novel that was made by Adult Swim. But I mean that in the best possible way. Mm. I see. 
All right. So. Yeah, I've, I've heard of a couple others that, uh, that that fit that description, <laughs> and played a few <laughs> ones myself, but I'm 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 not, I'm gonna I'm not mention those. Yeah. Um, I will also say that um, in general, all of my characters represent some part of me to a certain extent. Um, like, not I, I I'm I'm. There's a meme in my community that, that uh, the cat that I use for my profile picture, uh, who like, appears at the end of every build, is my fursona. But I actually don't have a fursona, because I generally cannot conceive a single character who could possibly represent all of me. Because I'm just fucking all over the place, dude. Um, so instead, every character, or almost every character that I write, has some piece of me in them. Um, with Isaac, for example, it's my it's my fears uh, towards uh, towards the future, the ones that that started this whole adventure. Uh, with Mary, it would be my my desires. Uh, with with Nally, it would be my awkwardness. With Jasper, it would be my quote unquote professionalism, if we can even call it that. Um, in general, there's always a part of me in every character, and that's what helps me relate to them. It it's what helps me write them to be. Even though they're clearly exaggerated, still human in a way, if that makes sense. Right. Okay. Great answer. All right. So this is a, this one is a little bit of a palate cleanser. Do you have any favorite books you'd like to tell us about? I actually haven't. Like I'm, I used to read a bunch of books when I was a kid. I I never like. Reading books always felt a little weird to me. I, I never read many books, um, like physical books. I'm more of a reading online web comics kind of guy. Um, and also fan fictions, which are, well, back when I, back in 2015, uh, which was when I started writing as a, as a hobby. Um, one book that I do want to mention though, it's this Italian, I wouldn't even call it a classic. It's just a book that really shaped my childhood. It's called The Dragon Girl. Um, translator obviously and it's a tale about this uh girl that's a that's that's an orphan basically raised in an orphanage who's adopted by this uh crazy doctor guy who reveals to her that he actually adopted her because she's a descendant of one of the uh of the humans who fought with dragons against wyverns in a in a battle at the beginning of time basically for the fate of the world and she has the, the the soul of one of the guardian dragons of the world tree living inside her soul and she together with a bunch of other kids needs to go out and find all the fruits of a world tree to restore this ancient city before the forces of the evil wyvern find all the trees and use them to uh, find all the fruits and use them to revive their dark master and it's um it's a it's a teenager novel, you know, like there's a there's there's a going all over the world uh, searching for these mystical artifacts. There's uh, fights, there's romance, uh, very awkward romance, but sure. Uh, and it's and it also features humans turning into uh, half dragon hybrids, you know, uh, so that also helped. <laughs> Anthro dragons. That I was. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I was always, a, like, I think ever since stuff like American Dragon Jake Long and similar cartoons. Oh, my God. The idea of, uh, <laughs> of, of transformation in that regard. Uh, only as a creative idea. Let's not put any weird I, weird thoughts out there. <laughs> um, and so I thought, you know what? This looks cool. And to a certain degree, it influenced what I would eventually become. All right. So... For myself, I guess uh, I'll, I'll just go with one one uh, pick for myself. What really influenced me when I was younger was a book series by the author Alan F. Troop. Unfortunately, he, he's, he passed away a few years ago. He wrote a series called The Dragon de la Sangre, and it was about hmm. a hidden race of dragons that could shapeshift into humans and live amongst us. And Ooh. the story, yeah, the story followed an adult an adult male dragon of a of royal blooded descent. Who was living in like the Florida Keys, clo like cl close to Miami or something like that? And there was like, I think there was five books in the series. There was like one where he where he finds a mate, but he gets like involved with like the the local mafia, and they start hunting him and his, and his mate. And then like, 
in the sequel, they go to, like, Jamaica, and he, because and, she, like, I'm not gonna spoil it, but, like, he goes to visit her family, there's a lot of dra dragon on dragon drama there, and, like, and the, finally, it's like the fifth book is just full-blown draconic warfare out in the open where humans are. <laughs> I see. You yeah, definitely have to. Yeah, you definitely have to, just to share the title with me later on, because um, uh, I've already forgotten it, sadly. But it sounds cool. Oh, it's called the Dragon Della Sangre. Yeah, that's the la the last part is is killing me. Oh, um, okay. Yeah, sadly, I'm I'm not good with foreign names. But yeah. Oh, that's fine. Uh, I'll uh, I'll just type it to you next time. Yeah, that's fine. All right. So I on to the next question. Do you have any upcoming projects to tease or to talk about? Well, that's kind of like uh, a bit early to say that, considering that we have barely finished Act 1 of the visual novel, uh, and not even really. There's still a little bit coming after. Uh, like, our next update is going to be mostly quality of life improvements, but not really, because uh, this month I go on, on vacation briefly, uh, and general, like, we're planning the future updates basically there is a little bit coming uh, but it's not going to be an actual chapter basically um and another reason why we're taking so long is because i'm actually uh this is the first time i i shared this uh publicly we're planning on getting an mf on steam uh, oh so that'll yeah we we I, this was like my one of my other editors who suggested this to me uh because right now on, on steam uh the only like there's very few furry visual novels that are that I would consider good on Steam right now. Like I, I played a few of them that I'm not even going to name, and it was dreadful. Uh, I think the only ones who are holding the line right now in terms of quality are uh, Crown of Leaves, which I played, and it was really nice. I've heard that's good. And yeah, uh, it's a um, it's a like a choose your own adventure and also point and click kind of game so it's really well done um and i think also the hayseed knight got a, um, a sizable following what's it called i never tried that one though the hayseed knight oh okay never heard of that yeah i, I heard it by name a bunch of times but sadly i never tried it out um but other than that most of the games are generally speaking either very low quality or just very horny uh with few other <laughs> qualities. and so we thought you know what why not? Let's go on Steam and see if that works. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what kind of returns we're going to have there, considering I can't even advertise my patron and coffee uh, on there. Um, I'll have to make like a special version of the game to just to, to fit Steam, basically. Right. Uh, and we're probably going to get a lot of messages like you for a game of SMH, my SMH. Uh, Furry you know. games are doing pretty well on Steam from what I've seen. Um, I, I'm a little skeptical, but you know, once we're once we're in there, uh, I can just keep going. Like keep, I can pump out updates on my own. Just need to make a few changes, basically, uh, every time, and hopefully that'll help us grow a little bit more. Um, in general, though, other than that, uh, even though I have a lot of ideas for other VNs that I eventually want to work on, and some that I'll never get to work on, right now it's just way too soon to bought out anything else you know all right fair enough all right on to the next question what inspired the world of no more future well this is a story that um that i've told a bunch of times already but basically no more future came out as a result of an extremely bad depressing episode that i had in 2020 uh yeah, uh, basically towards the, the last few weeks of August, uh, I started having panic attacks at night, thinking about my future basically, because like up until that point, I was studying uh, business at, at university, but it wasn't my first choice. I thought that I was going to become like a comic book writer or something, but I never got to a, a chance to really work on one. And I felt like I was really wasting my life and I thought, Someday I'm gonna die. It could be any day now. And when that happens, what's gonna await me in the afterlife? You know, like I've, I'm, I'm of, I'm of Catholic. Uh, I was, I was raised quote unquote a Catholic. Let's, let's call it that. Yeah, me too. Um, but, 
and, and so I do believe, or I want to believe, that there's a, an afterlife of some sort. But the idea that there could just be nothing after this life just paralyzed me. I, my, I could feel my heart burst out of my chest. I could not physically go to sleep. I was hounded by these thoughts. I could not chase away. And for a long time, that was all like, it, and it happened always like towards the end of the day. Like I was preparing to go to sleep and everything was fine. Then bam, dead. <laughs> um, Existential crisis. Yeah. And that's actually, I, I even went to therapy for that. Like I, I, I hadn't gone to a psychologist for quite a long time. Uh, but, but, but luckily, um, I managed to get help for that. But one of the things that did come out of all this was the idea of no more future. Uh, the idea of a person who has to constantly wrap their heads around these kinds of things, you know, kind of have to wonder whether what, what's going to wait them in the, in the afterlife and stuff. And so I don't recall exactly what led me to develop the world of NMF, but that's more or less where I, what caused me to be inspired to create such a thing, basically. Okay. That's a, yeah, that's really interesting, because I, actually I, uh, I kind of went through a similar thing where I, I was having like an existential crisis myself. It, it, I, I sometimes get panic attacks as well at night. And uh, wow. I'll just kind of like, just my, my, my mind will be running like, oh God, what have you done? What have you accomplished? Oh, what's waiting for you after this? Is anything waiting for you after this? It, it's just, sometimes oh, I wish yeah, I could I... just punch the fuck out of my mind at night so it can just shut the fuck up. <laughs> mm. But yeah. Yeah, when... <laughs> I mean, that's one of the things that I wanted to do with No More Future. Like the prologue, I, I'm always scared to propose No More Future to other people because the prologue is just a lot. Uh, it's very direct, very in your face, very, fuck you, you're going to get an existential crisis right now, and there's nothing you can do about it. Uh, but to this extent, I think that I achieved in my, in my goal, which was to be relatable to a lot of people, because at some point, everybody goes through what Isaac did, or, or at least like what I did. Uh, everybody starts wondering about these things, wondering the, the meaning, the value of their life, the possibility of an afterlife, what, what, what this all meant basically in the grand scheme of things. And so in this regard, I think that I succeeded in creating an experience that a lot of readers can immerse themselves in and really understand and, co and connect with. Yeah, uh, and I agree. I think you did as well. I think you've done a great job with it so far. I'm glad to hear that. Okay, so, number seven. What got you into the furry fandom? Uh, uh, this is a little bit difficult to explain. Um, I don't remember exactly what it was. I was browsing YouTube, and at some point I saw a video poking fun furries or something, or maybe shitting on them or something. Uh, it, it featured a lot of drawings in them that the person... I don't, I don't even recall exactly what kind of video it was. I just, I just saw there were a bunch of drawings of furries, basically. And I thought they looked fine. So I, I never heard of the term furry before. So I started uh, Googling it. I was like thir 12 or 13 at that point. Uh, and I found a lot of cool drawings and then lots of drawings that uh, featured body parts that at first <laughs> I was a little bit curious what they were. But eventually I realized, oh shit, that's a penis. Um, that's, that, that's interesting. Uh, and even though I never was a very, like, like my quote-unquote friends, and I use the term very loosely because I never really had any friends growing up because I'm never always alone and stuff. Um, uh, they talked about sex a lot uh, and even uh, showed each other videos of sex and, and shit. And I just always felt like that was so boring, like I, so disgusting even. Like I never really saw the, the point and all that, you know. Uh, but here I saw these things and instead of being repelled, I was like, intrigued not in the ooh that looks hot kind of thing more like that seems interesting why would someone need to draw this um and from there you know just kind of like went down the rabbit hole and just saw the everything that this fan had to offer let's put it that way um and yeah that's kind of like how i got in uh and for the longest of times i just was just a lurker basically just con happy to see what new levels of depravity I would witness that particular day. Um, and then in, 
I, when I started writing, after I wrote my fair share of fanfics uh, for Undertale and stuff, which is how I got my start uh, as a writer, I realized, you know what, I could probably write a story featuring anthrop anthropomorphic animals. I mean, I kind of grew up with them. Uh, I always like the idea of putting them in mature situations. I've seen a bunch. I've read a bunch of web comics that, that did that. So why not try to write furry furry novels, not visual novels yet, just novels. Um, and so in 2016, I joined. A fucking, I joined Furry Amino, back when that was relevant. Uh, and <laughs> wow, yeah, it was a lot. Um, and so yeah, like. Amino taught me a lot of things. The first is that I really don't know how to talk to people. Uh, I was still 16, 17 at that point, and I was really unprepared for internet communication if my previous attempts at having friends with other Undertale fans uh, told me anything. Uh, the other thing is that, again, furries really don't give a shit about writing, because even Amino uh, the only things that really, uh, like, they, they had a trending tab and everything, and the only things that would ever trend on there were uh, artworks and fursona, uh, like, fursuit picks. And they had to, like, literally make us a day of the week dedicated to, re uh, to, to, to put on the trending page uh, writing stuff. Uh, and, because nobody, otherwise nobody was reading anything. Uh, and the only reading, the, like, the only novels... Uh, slash poems slash uh, anything really that would get re that would get like a lot of engagement uh, that was writing related would be if you got featured on that page. Uh, and in that regard, I had an, uh, I used to have a friend who really liked my writing, uh, and he was a moderator on the app, so he helped me out a ton in that regard. Um, insider trading, you could say. Uh, I'm <laughs> kidding. Like. At the end of the day, I don't. I don't think my my writing from that from that era was particularly bad, but it wasn't particularly good either. But still, the fact that at least I got some semblance of engagement and like the idea that if only it could be marketed correctly, people could theoretically read what I wrote, was enough to keep pushing me further and further. Um, but eventually, like, I, I mean, it really didn't speak to me all that much. There were a bunch of sca scandals that were starting to happen on the, on the platform. And so uh, I left eventually. And sadly, not a whole lot remains from my time over there. Um, but, you know, it was a start, like any, and eventually led me here. So That's yeah, quite that's an origin story. <laughs> yeah, I wish it could be a little bit more interesting or anything, but sadly, it's just a boring origin story of guy finds interesting art on on on, on the internet and decides to follow up on it. Guy discovers good. sexuality. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so for myself, what got me into the fandom, and this is going to make this is either going to make some people listening to this feel old, or it's going to make some younger furries scratch their head. I got into the fandom on Furcadia. I, I, I've heard of that by name, but I never understood what the fuck that was. It was basically a 2D MMO for furries. I see. Huh. Y yeah. Y it was basically just like kind of like a big social hub. Uh, they had like user-made content that would be called Dreams that would be... Uh, it would use like uh, custom made assets or uh, or assets made by by the devs and everything and yeah that's where I met some of my um, my best friends at the time. There was a guy named Ray. There was a girl named Xana to Drake. Uh, uh, Suko was my wolf sister. <laughs> yeah, that's where I really got into the fandom and I started the fandom off as a werewolf. And how do you how do you find Furcadia? Um, actually, I just, I had some friends who got me into it on, uh, Yahoo Instant Messenger. God, I feel even older now. <laughs> yep, Yahoo Instant Messenger. But, You're uh, really gonna make a lot of young people feel like they're out of their... Out a, lot of, of a lot of young people ain't gonna know what the fuck I'm talking about. True. <laughs> oh my god, yeah, all you young furries out there, look up for Kadia. It was awesome back then. It was revolutionary back in the day. All right. So let's move on to... Ah, yes. A pressing question that I know has been on everyone's mind. Will Jasper ever find happiness? Um, good question. Uh, 
like, I don't know. Uh, it's really hard to like even comment on this kind of stuff without accidentally potentially spoiling anything. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> I will say that um, I know it's it, it's kind of hard to figure out considering everything people read in my game, but. Uh, my game is fucking all over the place, dude. Uh, it's, it goes in a thousand different directions at once. You're never quite sure where it's gonna end up, what new shit's gonna be introduced. Man, um, writing is hard! I mean, writing is fun! I don't know about hard. Like, it's it's definitely hard a bunch of times, but, it mo but it's more so because I'm lazy as hell. Yeah, um, when you're trying to keep track I'm of everything. When I'm actually writing, it's not that bad. Um, but mostly, like, what I'm trying to say is that my novel will go some really interesting places that nobody will see coming. I am 100% certain that nobody's figured out. Like I, I, I see a bunch of, I, I, I used to see a lot, a lot of theories on my, on my server about like where the story was gonna go and stuff, and a lot of them were pretty, eh. And some got a little bit close to what I had plans for, but nobody really figured out everything that i that i have planned because it's just so out there so ridiculous so much bullshit and there's no conceivable way somebody could realistically come up with it you know over the me um and so well well jasper find happiness depends on whether the plot will be crazy enough to allow for it you know all right fair enough yeah i i would definitely like to see him unlodge that stick from his ass at some point <laughs> yeah, sadly, business people be like that. I would yep. Know. Oh, yeah. I, I, I used to work alongside corporate. I worked for a major telecom company for a few years, and I worked alongside corporate people all the time, and they're a lot like Jasper. Yeah, though I have to say, like, from personal experience, I'd rather a guy who's, like, an asshole but fair compared to someone who tries to be friendly and is really just a fucking asshole. Absolutely. You know, I, I, that's absolutely. I agree with I'm that. That's what I'm working with right now in real life, and it's just a pain. Okay, so. All right, uh, another pressing question. Uh, I'll ask this uh, telling you that I haven't fully played through the new build. Uh, more Apollo win. Um, we love Apollo. We soon, actually. Like, yeah, uh, I will say that Apollo is sadly one of those characters that is that feels a little underutilized right now, and I totally, I, I totally see that. I think Nem kind of uh, shares that, uh, share, shares that box with him, and also to some extent George as well, um, even though George is not supposed to be like a, as much of an important character at this point. Um, it's just the problem with having such a big cast that you're never quite sure um how to balance them all in a realistic way um because obviously isaac ha will have a life you know and will hang out of these characters more but how much of that do i want to show you know like how much of that is really interesting for the audience to see um and how do i juggle that compared to other characters like jasper like mary like bradbury like other more plot relevant characters and I do really love all these characters. Uh, like, I, I think I, I like most, if not all, of my cast. Uh, but sadly, sometimes the plot that I want to write is more important than the slice of life that other people might want to see instead. Um, and so, yeah, so far, Apollo's just appeared in a bunch of chapters, and that was it so far. But trust me, that'll change in the future. He'll become more and more relevant, and we'll talk more and more with him. And, and hopefully he'll be what people are looking for, you know? Yep. Uh, awesome. I'd love to see more of him. I definitely we, will, we definitely want to see more of Nim and his sister as well. God, Nim and his sister, they're quite a duo. Yeah, I've, I've read, like, I, I think I wrote a little bit of this uh, in, like, at the end of the, uh, at the end of the build. Uh, I do these, um, I write these library sequences at the end of a build. I'm, I'm pretty sure you never got to read a single one of them because of the because a, a new build came out every time, just in time for you to not see it. But yeah. Basically, uh, at the end of every build, there's a an intermission sequence basically with this character that's supposed to be all meta and stuff. And in this new se in this new sequence from this last chap from this last update, uh, we talk a lot about like early mistakes that we did in development. One of them was uh, I got. Like, I was thinking, how do I finance this project? Well, I can sell main character slots to people for a lot of money, 
And that way I can both find the direction for my story, because at the time I had ideas, but I didn't really know what I was doing, more or less. Uh, and also I just, you know, I'm a great writer, you know, like that, I gotta be a great writer if I, if I want to write this story. Uh, so I can totally do this, you know, I have to do this. Uh, that was a terrible idea, but I still got paid. Uh, and so that's how Nem got into the, into the, the story. Because he was uh, the character of one of my friends, uh, one of my closest friends at the time, in fact. Um, and I, I liked him, you know, he was a little, like the character's a little bit out there. Like I had to explain away all his oddities in, in very ridiculous ways. But I think he works in a, a little bit. But we spent a fuck ton of time trying to figure out what he was going to be. Because at first, uh, the original idea was that he was going to be uh, like a a dream dragon, basically, that appeared in people's dreams and could only exist in a dream world, basically. And since Isaac somehow also had dreams, uh, he was wondering why he'd never seen him around before, basically, or something like that. And that was going to be uh, like how the character worked, basically. Then. It, it became a little bit of a hybrid kind of thing where he also existed in the real world and stuff. But that also like didn't really work out because at that point uh, I, I knew that abilities were, were going to be a thing because I, I like my action to be spicy. Um, but I, I felt like that was going to be a little bit of a stretch and also that was going to like tip the audience a little bit too much in the Isaac is a real person kind of thing because like I, I do want to keep pointing the idea that maybe he's his own person, maybe he really is his old self, maybe he's something else entirely, you know. The question of uh, the... Like, I know lots of people tend to project onto him, and therefore uh, he has to have a soul for that reason. Um, but I really want to keep it ambiguous uh, up until it won't be, um, or uh, assuming that's what's going to happen. Um, and so I felt like having something like that in the game would have tipped too much the audience in favor of uh, Isaac having a soul. Um, and so we scrapped that, went back, and eventually decided, you know what, he's gonna be Isaac's old friend that we never introduced before in any conceivable way, but now he's his old friend and it's <laughs> going to be very important. Um, and his sister was a bit of a similar, like uh, I didn't got, get paid for his sister, but back then, uh, he introduced me to one of his closest friends who's also an artist and um, she had a character that she created to basically be Nem's uh, sister basically um, and we thought you know what they could be sisters in, in canon as well and so in exchange for some favors which sadly never really went anywhere uh, we put her in the game and now she's there and we're working with her um, she's definitely not going to be like Nem and Yume are not going to be super major characters like they're like they're they're mostly secondary characters especially yume who's um who's, who only exists basically to further nam's narrative right let's put it that way um but i do i hate when people just write characters for the sake of writing characters and just abandon them basically to themselves so nam's story will definitely go some places um and it will be interesting to follow um and it's just uh it's just that I prefer writing uh, other character stories, you know, <laughs> which is sad. Um, but sadly, I'm more of a like I, I. You can tell where I put most of the effort when writing No More Future. It's in the it's in the action sequences, in the drama, it's in the political stuff, uh, the the philosophical talk. And sadly, Nem is for the moment is just regular slice of life, you know. Um, and so, right right now, he's there. We'll see if in the future he develops uh, to become something else. Um, but yeah, that's it for now. All right, oh, awesome answer. Explains quite a bit. All right, yeah. so early, early Sedge was a really dumb Sedge. Early Sedge was a dumb Sedge. I think it can be said for most of us. Our earlier versions were dumber than our current versions. Yeah. All right, so. This next question, how often do you collaborate with other creators? Um, I usually don't shy away from, um, from collabing. I often, uh, like when, when I have a, a creator that I really respect, uh, or a story that I really like, I will offer collabs. Uh, for Supernova, for example, I was approached by Rot, 
uh, to do this. I don't recall exactly why he wanted to do it, um, but we did it. Uh, recently we had to stop though because I think that um, he wants to move, like at the end of the day the no more future reference in Supernova is a bit uh, strange, makes it seem like our stories are connected and stuff when they're really not. Um, we did toy with the idea though at some point. Um, but yeah, like the problem with collaborations is that uh, any story that wants to take itself seriously wants to stand on its own basically, uh, cannot really reference another story unless it's serious, you know? Um, so as much as I want to, you know, do cameos and collabs, uh, like the one I did with Rook, for example, uh, who uh, appears in the, um, in the in the bar CG in Chapter yeah. 4, um, sadly it doesn't happen very often, you know? Um, and I don't think I ever did another collab since then. I'm, I'm really trying to think hard on that, but sadly, I, if, if I did, I completely forgot. Alright, that's fair. It's always nice to hear how you and other creators get along, you know, how you vibe together, how you work together. I, was, I was just always think it's, it's interesting how a, kind of a tight-knit community like this uh, talks. Yeah, sadly, like, um, my, my problem is that I tend to come off a bit strongly to other people. Um, I, tend, I, I like to think that it's very obvious when I'm joking, but uh, it kind of goes from person to person. Some people can tell that I'm joking. Some people can tell, but really don't can't stand it. Um, and so, to me, public relations have always been really hard um, because of that. I do tend to, I, I do support that creators should be nice to one another, you know? Like, there's really no reason to have enemies in this community. Uh, at the end of the day, we're all trying to do our thing, and doing our thing supports other people doing their own thing, because of course, once somebody reads a, a visual novel and they like it, they tend to go on and read other visual novels. So in this in this sense, one person's success is the success of everybody. Um, but sadly, you know, shit happens. You know, people come like have disputes. They just don't mesh well, um, and sometimes it ends poorly, uh, which is what you tend to try and avoid. Uh, in general, I always believe that people should always be open to try and smooth over uh, mistakes of the past uh, and just try not to hang up on stuff. Um, sadly, that can be applied to everything. Uh, there's always going to be a couple of individuals in every community that you just can't reason with. Um, and, you know, you just have to deal with it, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I agree with you. But okay. In general, I, I, I just rather not talk about any specific uh, pre like, as much as I like to talk in general, so I'd rather not go into the specific, because otherwise people start thinking I'm talking about them, uh, or that I'm talking about this person they know, and they start hounding me about it, or got or drawing their own conclusions. And ah, it's really furry not drama. Good yeah, it's everywhere. <laughs> there's some, in this com in this community. There's, there's some new shit every day. For yep. real. Yep. People love and their drama. And then I have to explain it to my family, and then I have to explain ten thousand other things they need to know before they can understand what I'm talking about. Yep. Um, so please stop doing that. <laughs> yes, you heard it here first, people. Please stop doing that. Knock that shit off. Whatever you're doing, stop. Yep. All right, on to the next question. This is a, this is a bit of another uh, little palate cleanser. What kind of uh, uh, non-visual uh, novel games are your favorites? Um, I I was always... Uh, I got my start with uh, Age of Empires and Age of Mythology especially. Some Ooh, more games on my PC. I love Age of uh, Mythology. I, but I also... But I, like, I played a fuck ton of stuff growing up, mainly Nintendo stuff. Uh, I was never a, a PlayStation... Like, I, I had a PlayStation 1 and 2, uh, but I never really considered myself a PlayStation player. I never tried an Xbox. I was mostly just an X, just a Nintendo and PC kind of guy. Uh, and in general, my, my favorite genres have always been strategy games uh, and management games. Um, so turn-based stuff, RPGs, um, city builders... Um, Right now, I'm playing a lot of Against the Storm, which is this uh, roguelite city builder that's in early access right now. One second. All right, no problem. Um, yeah, sorry about that. You're good. Um, and so, yeah, like, I, I've always got a new game that I'm trying out every... Like, sometimes I get a, da a game that I'm playing for, like, months straight, but usually I just play one game for a, for a while, and then I played something else entirely, you know? Yeah. 
Um, yeah. But yeah, in general, I just play lots of turn-based uh, strategy games and stuff. Okay, so for myself, when I was younger, I actually I remember on uh, my parents had like a Windows 98, and we went to uh, Tallahassee in Florida, and we went to the, uh, the Babbage's that they had there before they just renamed it to GameStop. And I went to their PC section, and I saw this, this, this box sticking out from the side. It's a little bit worn, but I, uh, I grabbed it, and I pulled it, and I looked on the cover, and it was Unreal. And from that day forward, I've, well, I've been like very majorly into first-person shooters. Unreal, for me, and I'm actually, the, the soundtrack that's playing in the background of this video is the OST for Unreal. <laughs> But, uh, yes, I, I absolutely, I love first-person shooters, I love adventure games, RPGs, RTS games, I love open-world games, I love exploring, I'm an explorer by heart. But, yeah, I'd say that some of my all-time favorites are, uh, let's see, uh, Doom, Quake, Unreal, Unreal Tournament, um, I'll say, um, uh, Supreme, the Supreme Commander series, uh... Not not as much of a Duke Nukem fan as a lot of other people are. I, I think I think it's just it's it's just all right. I don't I don't think it's aged as gracefully as a lot of other genres, especially with what Gearbox has done to it. <laughs> but yeah, that uh, that I think that'll about do it for me. All right, let's go on to the next question. Okay, so what direction do you see the visual novel landscape going in in the future? Like, how do you think it'll evolve, or do, how do you think it'll change? Well, it's kind of hard to predict because it's always gone in 10,000 different directions at once. Uh, for the most part, it's always been very dating sim kind of focus, very romance focus, because, you know, uh, not only is it a favorite genre of a lot of people uh, who read these kind of novels, uh, but it's also what pays the bills uh, in many scenarios. Um, but lately, you see a lot of projects that don't really appeal to this main fan base like remember the flowers for example sure it's a it's it, it features a lot of quote-unquote simping but not really like not in the way that for example marco sims for amicus and adastra or uh similar visual novels like it's a different kind of novel that takes itself very seriously uh even when not talking about romance or sex or whatever um especially considering that he never talks about sex to begin with, but still. Um, and lately there's also Glory Hounds is trying new ground. I love it. Um, <laughs> yeah, there's um, there's a lot of new projects coming out lately that are just trying to do their own thing and not putting their own unique spin on the, on, on the formula or sometimes even ditching it entirely and going in completely different directions. And you also see a, a bigger level of polish in, in, in some regards. Uh, sure, there's still a lot of VNs that are just kind of like fresh off the oven and are already kind of terrible, you know? Like, they, they start off already dead, basically, because they're made by people with no experience and most of the time no real desire to grow up or improve. Uh, not calling anyone out, by the way, just my own impression. Um, but you also see a lot of these high-budget, high-invest... Like, sometimes not even high-budget, just high-investment high quality novels that come out and just sweep everybody off their feet. Uh, Glory Hounds is one. I've also heard really nice things about Soul Creek, which I eventually want to try I've never heard of that. Um, apparently it's another My Wolf novel, but not really. Uh, it came out strong with like a 60,000 word first build, uh, which was, which sounds crazy because 60,000 words is a lot. Um, and so, yeah. Right now, it's kind of hard to tell where it's going to go from here. The furry visual novel scene is always going to be like a very amateurish scene, so we're always going to see lots of like very, again, amateurish VNs out there. That's never going to change. I but think that's part of the part of the, the fun, though. Yeah, but where the the high echelons, let's call it that, of furry VN stories go from here, that's going to be really exciting because it's really interesting to see. Um, what kind of new shit we're going to come up with next, you know? I think the furry visual novel scene has always been, like, this crazy place that's just completely off the mainstream uh, and can just pursue whatever the hell it wants to do without having to worry about what sells, what's, what's, what's palatable, what's popular. Um, 
And so it's interesting to see where we go when we combine this niche interest with higher and higher levels of quality and resources and and, and, and development, you know? Yeah. So I'm just going to Personally, put... I want to see more safe work stories that focus a lot of action and big drama. Ooh. Yeah. I'm kidding. Yeah, uh, I, could, I could definitely get behind that. What I wanted to throw out there, just, I just want to throw this idea out into the ether to see if someone makes it into something. Uh, furry Mecha Harem. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Furry Mecha, I think there's already a novel like that. It's called ICO. Um, it's made by uh, Cetus. Um, it used to be fairly strong, but then I think it's being remade right now. I tried out the new prologue that he put out recently, and it's really cool. So I don't know if it's going to be a harem, but <laughs> it's definitely Mecha. Okay. Hmm, that sounds interesting. I'm going to have to check that out. It's called ICO. Yeah, I C O Machina Lutris. I C O. So, Ico. <laughs> yeah, not not Ico, the game from the creators of Shadow of the Colossus, <laughs> more like I C O. Okay. <laughs> all right. Yeah. So, all right. So, moving on to, yeah, we'll be done shortly. Actually, um, moving on to the next question: If you could become a synthetic, would you? I mean, I do think that. Like, probably, yeah. Like, I, I don't really feel particularly attached to this body and any possibility of getting away from my imminent and unescapable demise would very much be welcome. Um, and so, yeah, I don't, I don't really see why I wouldn't do it. Yeah, there's a little bit of an interesting thing in human psychology about the, the, the human brain. So people say if, if the brain is you, if the brain is the origin of you, why do we why do we uh, refer to the brain as it instead of I? Why do we view like what what our self is as something separate from the brain? That, to me that, that to me I, I, I like the I just like the idea of that like who, yeah, your, your body is your body is not you. Your body is an extension of you. Our body is like this incredible machine that we know absolutely nothing about. Like we can kind of like control it subconsciously. Uh, but we never really start out of all this knowledge of how it works. Like, we have to learn how our body works. We don't just start out of that knowledge. It's really crazy. Uh, and so the idea that we are this, this brain is, is, in, is pre it's pretty difficult to believe for me because if I was the brain, the brain knows what it's doing to a certain degree. So it's really strange that I don't know what I'm doing all the time. Yeah. Uh, the way well, I feel it, I feel that the, uh, I feel that the body is a ship. I feel that mm. the brain is like the cockpit. Mm. And what I mean, you, yeah. but what I don't want to like. I don't. Yeah. I I don't really want to like. However, uh, make it seem like I believe like because like obviously, it, it it'd be very compelling to say that just because I believe in stuff like souls or an afterlife and stuff, then I believe that Isaac should also have a soul or something like that. Yeah. Uh, I want to make it clear that whatever I believe has nothing to do with what the what the story is oh well it does but not to that extent uh surely the story that i want to tell uh has a lot to do with what i believe is the person and what i believe people should be like let's put it that way but i don't want anyone to, see, to think like i'm pushing my beliefs onto them or that just because i believe certain things and certain things in the novel are like automatic you know um the novel still has quite a lot of tricks up its sleeve and i don't want anyone assuming anything because it's just going to make them look very stupid once they find out it's not how they thought it's going to be. Ooh, that sounds interesting. <laughs> I can't wait to find out more. All right, so yeah. on to the next most one of the most pressing questions of this entire interview. I know it's on the minds of everyone else listening in right now. What the hell are those things hanging off Natalie's collar? Uh, good question. Uh, I have no fucking idea. <laughs> Uh, I look yeah. at them, and they look like pins. Um, the thing with characters uh, is that I usually know what a character is like in my head. Like, I conjure up these characters as, like, these almost, like, perfect beings in my head, basically, that I know almost everything of. I immediately can come up with a character's backstory, their motivations, their personality. They all come off as distinct voices in my head, basically. 
But then when it comes to actually designing their person, their, their actual physical appearance, I'm always at a loss. Um, and so with Nick, uh, my artist, the way that we decided was like, you know what, I have a few characters that I really know what I want them to look like. I think the, the few ones in, right now are like Daphne, um, who's, um, who I really wanted to, to look that way. Um, but everybody else, like people like Isaac, people like Jasper, people like uh, George, I was always very unsure. Like I knew more or less what I wanted, but I never, but I, but I didn't want to stress the details. And the same is true for a lot of the locales. Uh, so with Nick, I'm always like, you know, this is what I need, but you can do whatever the fuck you want with it. And so he comes up with all these crazy designs uh, that are really stylish, like casual yet de defined. And I'm always in awe with every one of them. Uh, it's sometimes, sadly, they're a little bit like. Uh, they're a little bit too different from what I had in mind. I think, like, for example, the, um, the background for Isaac's apartment, like, at night, uh, was going to be completely different, because he, he imagined it, like, from um, from a bird's-eye view, basically, almost, uh, from, like, from the side of a building overlooking the, the street. And that really didn't sell the picture of, like, what the condo was supposed to look like, so I had to tell them, no, that's not exactly what we want. But oftentimes, like, he'll just do whatever, and I'll be fine with whatever as long as it looks nice. And so he'll often add all these interesting details to the characters or to the backgrounds. And it's always fun to just try to explain them through writing. Like for example, the big fucking lava lamp in, in Mary's office. That <laughs> was all him. And I thought it looked dope. So then I had to write a fucking reason why Mary is a big fucking lava lamp in her futuristic office. You know, and it's always so much fun. The entire thing of like the... Um, the shiny things hanging around Isaac that are supposedly a visual glitch or whatever. Um, that was also just his style, you know? Like, that that's just how he draws. And I was like, you know what? That looks cool. But people are going to wonder what the fuck those, those things are. So you know what? We're, we're going to explain them, you know? We're going to include them in the story. And that's, that's a fun thing that I get to do uh, that I'm not sure. Like, I, I don't think somebody who both draws and writes for their story would be able to do because obviously like they draw everything and everything has a meaning in their head uh but with me it's just nick draws whatever they want whatever he wants and he has all these like he just writes them because it's fun and then i write write them because it's fun um and yeah like i i ideally don't know what those things of natalie are supposed to be uh, i think probably nick explained it a bunch of times but i already forgot but they're there, and they look nice, and there's yeah. no reason to go in, in depth about them. So I just let them be, you know? They're just yeah. a part of their character. All right, awesome. I, I have to say, though, that it's not not her color, however. Uh, I, I had this discussion of him recently. It's not actually a color, it's just a part of her sweater. Oh, okay. Okay, fair enough. Well, I do, so I will say, I do love the character designs in this game. I think they're awesome. I think Isaac's yeah. design is, like, perfect. I think it fits him to a T. Yeah, that's one of the other designs. Like, I, I showed a bunch of pictures of Sins, uh, because he never... I don't think he ever drew one before. He drew a lot of similar things before. Um, I chose him specifically because he, he drew a thing, uh, like, at the start of, of 2021. Uh, I think I, con I contacted him towards the beginning of February of that year, basically. Um, and he drew, like, a picture of, like, this half, like, half robotic anthro creature, basically. Uh, and it looked really sick. And that was exactly what I was looking for. Uh, but other than that, like, I had no idea what, what Isaac was going to be, except the fact that he was going to be kind of a blank slate character. So we settled with white. Um, and in the end, his design was is still a little bit different compared to other synthetic designs, uh, to other synth design, rather, from Vader-san. Um, he kind of comes off as, like, his own character, which is good because synths in this, in this context are very different compared to, like, the quote-unquote canon synth lore which is not really canon, but still, it's more like suggestions. Um, and I was suggested a lot, like, it, it was very suggestive, but in, in the end, we created our own thing, and it, it's, it looks really cool, you know? Um, the only downside of this is that, like, Nick's style is very different compared to the usual uh, FBN artist. I think lots of people try to go with either a very realistic or a very anime style for their novel. And so Nick comes out with these shining colors and abstracts uh shapes and stuff and 
there's a lot of people that told me that the novel like really looked way too dank for them basically uh, which is always sad to hear because I, I think it looks dope personally but you know bias and all that but I definitely do think that the novel that the art style like more so even more so than the writing is what sells or doesn't sell the VN to people all right all right awesome uh, thank you for explaining that Okay, so, are there any characters that you would ship together and no more future? No. Um, <laughs> I really don't care about, like, I, I, I don't read visual novels for the romance or the sex. Like, to me, that's just something on top of things. Like, you know, like, if, if it, it, I only care about it if it makes the story better. And if it makes the story worse, I can tell. Um... And so, with No More Future, there was the question of whether I wanted to have no, not, not safe work content in the story. And I thought, you know, that's going to make me a lot of money if I decide to go down that route. But A, that, that feels kind of cheap, you know? Like, at the end of the day, I don't, I, don't, I don't want to succeed if the only reason why I succeeded was because I included porn in my story, or romance, or whatever. Uh, I want people to write to like the story because of what I actually wrote, you know, because of the of the political stuff, because of the philosophical stuff, because of the action, because of the intrigue, uh, the mystery, the the drama, you know, like the, what what I actually like. Like I wanted people to like the story for the same reason that I do, um, and so that's one of the reasons why I didn't do it. But the other reason why I didn't do it is just because I couldn't think of how the fuck I was going to implement all that, you know, like how was I going to realistically and most importantly satisfyingly include not safe for content in my story like sure i had a bunch of jokes like for example isaac discovering that he had a, a dick and finding and mary telling him uh <laughs> to use the robo dick for science or whatever like i had a bunch of jokes <laughs> planned for such an eventuality but at the end of the day that's that's all i had just a bunch of jokes and no real purpose to exploring any of that stuff so i decided you know what let's scrap it Let's go the hard. Let's 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 choose very hard mode on character select, and decide to write the story that I want to write and make it as good as I can make it without having to force myself or feeling like I'm being forced to add stuff that I'm not comfortable adding to the game. Well, guys, you you heard it here first uh, from Sedge. Sex, it's what's on top. <laughs> I mean, yeah, like that's that generally seems to be the like people. I, I've been scorned in the past for making these observations, but sadly, they're true. Uh, sex sells in this community, yeah. and that's not going to change anytime soon. The only ship probably that I that I would support is Natalie Cross Leslie, who's like my mu mu my musician, and really likes the character. I mean, he likes all the characters more or less. Like he really likes Isaac. He really likes Mary. A little bit too much, some would argue, uh, in very very not safe work manners. Uh, but you know, that's just that's just how he is. Uh, and I I mean. He can have Natalie, honestly. Like, there's really not, no reason for me not to give it to her, but sad to him. But sadly, <laughs> you know, like, that's not going to be the focus of the story. Maybe it, it would be fun to have... Like, I, I had him make a cameo in the in the April Fool's build of the game, but um, it would be fun to have him cameo even in the real game, but, like, we, we need to find some moment where that would make sense for it to happen, you know? Uh, for Nali to suddenly reveal that they have, that she has a boyfriend and for it to like not be something that we dwell on too, too much, you know? Yeah. Um, but yeah, like, that's really it. And it's more so like a crack thick than anything. Um, so yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. I don't really write the story thinking of ships and romance and stuff. And in general, like, that's not focused either way. All right, that's fair. Okay, uh, now for before our last slate of questions... Let's do one more palate cleanser. Do you have any favorite movies or TV shows you can share with us? Um, I'm not actually too much of a TV show or movie kind of guy. I never went to the movies. Um, I, there is one series that I really enjoyed as a child. It was called Ghost Whisperer. Um, oh. It's, uh, yeah, with... Um, I don't even remember her name. But it was a really cool story about this lady who lives in this fictional town of Grandview in the U.S. who can see ghosts and helps them move on into the afterlife by resolving their earthly quarrels, basically, that are keeping them tethered. Um, and it went on for five seasons, and it was really cool. Like, I, I really enjoyed it. It was a really fun series, like, very episodic, 
every season just kind of like had its own thing that never really got resolved at any point um but you know it just it was fun honestly like i, I really just enjoyed it um and that's sadly i can't really say how that affected me as a as a creator it, it was just a novel it was just a story that i really enjoyed you know all right cool um so for myself uh, i never actually saw the ghost whisperer um i will say that one of my favorite movies of all time it kind of ties into my kind of spiritual and philosophical beliefs is uh cloud atlas if you've ever heard of that oh yeah um so funny story of that one um my parents actually brought me and my 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 uh my brother who's like two years younger than me when the movie first came out to the cinema to, to see it and i was watching it and i don't know if it was because i was younger or anything but a i couldn't follow it for jack shit like i didn't understand what the fuck was going on i couldn't keep track of who was who um like i i really couldn't tell like what any of this meant basically or who these characters were uh, and stuff but also i just found it very boring um again probably because i was very young um and i don't remember exactly what happened like there was this scene in movie where, where my brother started crying and yep. so my, yep. my parents eventually had to uh had, had to bring us out of the movie theater because they could stand like because my brother was like losing his mind at that scene um it, it was right after the the movie had come out so uh yeah I, I never watched it for that reason uh but i did read the synopsis of wikipedia which is basically what i do every story that i feel like reading but don't have the means to read uh I just read the, the Wikipedia synopsis, and it's and it feels good. You know, it seems good. Yeah. So for me, um, I had heard a lot of buzz about the movie. It was an adaptation by the Wachowski by the Wachowski uh, brothers. Well, Wachowski yeah. brother and sister now. But oh, yeah. um, Matrix is amazing. Like Matrix is also one of those films that really shaped my childhood. And uh, also, a lot of people had an issue with how it would swap between different time periods, and I can agree that it was jarring, but for me, I, f I feel like they managed it a lot better than other movies had done. Like, they, like they, they made it obvious, to me at least, that they were in a different time period with different characters, and I like how the different time periods are basically like different genres of movie. You had, like, one that was kind of like straight up, uh, straight up just dystopian, just dystopian horror another one that was actually kind of like uh you know old, old folks comedy and he had one that's like straight up uh, like uh dark romance and i just i it was one of those movies that I, I just i just kept watching over and over again and that particular scene you're talking about with your brother i think i know exactly what scene it was because it's the same scene that makes me cry every fucking time i watch that movie and i have never cried as much during a movie as I've cried during Cloud Atlas. <laughs> I'll just tell you that. But yeah, so um, I definitely love uh, for more stuff about me. I definitely like some a lot of the old school horror movies like Friday the 13th. I love Halloween, uh, Nightmare on Elm Street. I love a lot of the old B movies, despite there them a lot of them just being generally very very terrible. I like. Like, my parents and I would uh, watch, like, you remember the Sci-Fi channel? They would have, like, a Sci-Fi special, like, every Saturday. You Do, do you remember those? Or had, did, were you, did you ever watch any of those? Like, sorry, I didn't hear that. Oh, uh, what, what, uh, did you, uh, I was saying that. Uh, when I was younger, my parents and I uh, would watch uh, the Sci-Fi sci -fi channel. They would have, like, a Sci-Fi special, like, every Saturday. Did you, do you remember those? I don't know. I, I usually just watch cartoons, and that was it. Ah, uh, that's fair. They would have like awful. They would have like awful made-for-TV movies, like Raptor Island or Horror of the Sabretooth or some shit like that. And that's how I really got into B, like B-grade movies back in the day. Anyway, yeah, I was having the experience of those like those terrible Disney movies that came oh. out like during the the early 2010s, basically. Yeah. Uh, like girl versus monsters. Ew. Girl versus monsters. Uh, Radio Rebel was nice, at least. But anyway, yeah. Um, sadly, my experience with movies is a little bit limited. All right, that's fair. All right, so getting into the last few questions here, 
Um, actually, I'm going to go ahead and skip this one because you kind of covered it, and uh, you kind of covered it in an earlier question. Now, the question was, were there some improvements that you want to make over time? And you are, you already answered that earlier. So let's go ahead and skip that one, unless you wanted to add more to that. I mean, really, it's just just moving out like the game you know like I, I i did a big rewrite at the start of like at the end of the of last year um because i'm a perfectionist by nature i always feel like i gotta keep on improving and improving and improving uh, and now i have another idea for how i want to improve the early chapters but at the end of the day like i have to stop you know like people want new content and shit. so mm -hmm. that's what i'm focusing on right now maybe i'll i'll think about re-implementing these changes towards the end of the year again because it would be nice to like have the entirety of act one like set in stone you know i'm comfortable with it i'm happy with what it, I, I don't feel like i'm going to rework it again so we can start maybe like translating it and make it available in other languages i i received a bunch of offers to have it translated so it would be nice to like focus on that as well someday um but uh right now yeah I, I'm just planning on keeping on, on going, you know, make new stuff, make new, write new chapters, make new fight scenes, you know, keep, keep going. Awesome, and we do appreciate that. We all, we always uh, appreciate any more uh, builds or uh, quality of life improvements that you get, that you uh, swing our way. Okay, so what do you think of the current state of the furry visual novel scene in general? Do, do you think... Because you, earlier you were saying it was more amateurish. Um, but, like, I'm, like, like you said also, like, I'm seeing some, like, just heavy hitters. Like, uh, Changeling Tail. Like, Changeling Tail's got some, like, out-of-this-world production values. Man, yeah, but, but, I saw but, a lot of it. Like, I, I saw a bunch of, of your YouTube thumbnails, and, and it struck me as very interesting, but... I don't know like it felt also like not really my kind of genre but yeah recently there's just been a lot of bangers coming out yeah like uh, glory hounds has really just caught my attention lately I, I love the i love the production values of that it just comes across like just to me it feels like a whole new level like they're yeah. really aiming for the damn stars with this one like yeah it i think like obviously we're always going to be talking about like the big budget ones or the ones like art with artists uh that are really famous um like burrows like glory hounds like uh interia like um uh which which other ones um i'm looking through real quick at um, astra <laughs> i mean interia is kind of it you know um remember the flowers is nice but i, I really like remember the flowers so uh, but yeah, like we're always gonna be talking about like the big ones, but um, the furry division novel fandom has always been full of like small ones, you know, as well. And obviously, for somebody who's like approaching this fandom, wanting to write, uh, they are always questioning: Can I actually support an endeavor of this regard? Because obviously, like I can write the best story possible, but then I also have to I have to commission artists to draw it, and that's a big draw in for the audience. I have to program it. What if my visual novel comes off as too like terrible? Like it, it's called a little spaghetti, um, and so it can be a little bit of a daunting task, like seeing all these giants uh, and being like, okay, but how do I compare? Um, and uh, I think that it's fine. Like at the end of the day, what I care most in a visual novel is the writing. Like the art is fine and all, but if the writing is is trash, I don't care. Um, and I, I really do advise to people to just keep trying, you know. Uh, just write what you want to write, draw what you want to draw, and obviously, you know, if it's not good enough, people are not going to notice. Uh, but if it's good enough, eventually people will notice, because people are like, hey, this novel, it, it, it almost went under my radar, but I checked it out, and it was really cool. Uh, you should try it out as well. And it's like, like word of mouth is a really big motivator for people to check out other of visual novels and so even if you feel like your visual novel is never going to month to month because you don't have the budget uh to deal over, with other people's games as long as you are confident in your skill and are always eager to improve um uh, it's more so like a matter of like uh of attitude you know having the right attitude really sets you apart 
you again you can really tell when when some, when a story is good because you can tell that the attitude of the person who wrote it is good um and so yeah it, it i think the visual novel fandom is always going to be made primarily of complete fucking randos like i used to be coming on acting like hot shots and just creating their games and expecting people to read them what i do hope in the future is that more and more people come in with the wisdom to actually realize that their first build is probably going to be trash compared to their later ones and to always want to keep improving their game keep them keep honing their skills keep uh keep improving themselves as people you know and just strive to always be better every day than they were yesterday and that's what's really going to improve this fandom in general as time Ab goes on absolutely i definitely agree with all that we just need to support each other stay positive you know not be afraid to call out bullshit when we see it too yeah i think like that's one of the things that i sadly have to take offense with this fandom is the way that it handles criticism um because i think there's mainly two types of fvn fan uh the first type is oh my god this novel is the best thing i ever read in my entire life where was this my entire life oh my god it's the greatest thing in, of all time. And the second kind is, oh my god, this is terrible. This is garbage. The creator sucks, and this is total shit, and I'm going to make him my entire personality to tell you how terrible it is. <laughs> and I will talk about it all the time to make sure you know that I think the story is shit. Uh, and the first group sees the second group and is like, oh my god, those guys are cringe. Clearly, everybody who speaks poorly of our favorite visual novel belongs in that second group. And so, criticism, like fair criticism, is very rare in this fandom because you're either some, you're either a lover or a hater in general, um, and it's very hard to distinguish between people who criticize a game because they like it and people who criticize a game because they absolutely hate it. You know? Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, it's 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 an attitude problem in general. Like, there's also there's also the problem that all these novels uh, are free. You know. And when a novel is free, complaining about it feels worse, you know? At least, like, seeing people complain about them, you're like, oh my god, why, why are you spending your time talking shit about this game? It's free. Don't you know the creator literally pays so you can read this shit? Like, wh wh how dare you? Um, and so, yeah, it's definitely not the best environment to, for to, uh, to encourage healthy criticism. But I do hope that as time goes on, we mature a little bit and just start just accept the fact that in truth criticizing a game means that you actually really like it you know because you took time out of your day to explain why you f you fought you found faults in it you know like with Adastra for example for me Adastra is like one of those stories that like really that I really enjoy you know I, I enjoyed reading it I, I I never felt like I was wasting my time reading it uh, and to this day, I still think about how I could have changed the story in my own way. Uh, but it's still a game that to me is full of faults, plot holes, general nonsense moments that I that I really can't stand. And I will call them out when we're talking about them, but that doesn't mean that I hate the game. In fact, me talking about these things is how I show my appreciation for the game in a way, you know? Like it, it shows that I care. It shows that I that I'm passionate about this. It shows that it impacted me as much as anyone else. Um, yeah. And of course, there's always going to be the people who take it too far and and write absolute trash and pass it off as genuine criticism. But you know, that's, you just gotta learn to handle them as well. You know. Yeah. Like criticism does not always equal personal animus. Exactly. Right. Like, there's a lot of people who take insults as like personal personal attacks. Uh, no, sorry, uh, they take criticism as personal attacks, uh, and when it's really not meant to be. But yeah. yeah. Again, don't want to call anyone out with this. Just voicing my own opinions. You hear that, people? Sedge won't name. Better be on guard. <laughs> yeah, I could be talking about any one of you. Anyone. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> Please don't jump to the conclusion. <laughs> All right, so this next one is a little bit of an odder one. Um, not a lot of people have heard of this, but did you, did you know that uh, Sony is actually partially funding a furry visual novel on PlayStation? I have heard of it, and I generally could not care less. 
Okay. At, at the end of the day, it's really, it's not going to be a furry visual novel in, in the sense that, that everybody else here is. Like, uh, I think it's important that we as a group just kind of like stick to our, because like you see a lot in, in a lot of other, um, a lot of other communities that start out as like these very hobby-like environments. And then big corporations see the, the the forming market are like, I want a piece of that, and then they create their their stuff that sometimes is even okay, but it just doesn't have the same spirit, you know. Like people who made it are often not not in the same position as the ones who create regular stories, you know. Like I, the, the people who are creating this game, if I had to guess, are not in the same situation either. Uh, like they don't they don't have the same story backstory let's put it that way as a lot of other content creators for this for this platform platform yeah sure um and so it's important that we just recognize that they're that, that they're trying to enter that they're creating a product meant for us but that we treat it as its own separate thing you know because otherwise we risk uh them taking over the entire thing and then this just becomes another place where big corporations can can make money off of us you know yeah, I. What was that? What was that thing? Was it Skittles? Was it was it Skittles that was trying to get the furry community to make a mascot for them? I think that was Skittles, wasn't it? I have no idea. Okay, yeah, it was like Never a. Heard of it. Okay, it was like a thing on it was like a thing on Twitter where like Skittles was like uh, pandering to the fandom, saying like, "Oh, uh, we're we're doing like a a, a a Sona contest for Skittles," and this guy. I forget it. I forget what his Twitter handle is, but he popped on and said he'd give any he he would give people like a hundred dollars a a hundred dollars like a pick to show for them to draw like the a bag of Skittles getting banged by a horse a, a horse avatar, <laughs> and he gave out a lot of money for that. I just thought that was like it kind of shows like this fandom is inherently kind of uh very suspicious and guarded against corporate interests i think that's a good thing yeah sounds like a furry thing to do honestly yep but for anyone who is uh wondering what we're talking about it's a game coming out for playstation called goodbye volcano high um i'm looking mm -hmm. forward to it because i like the production yeah, values I mean, on I it wanna, i don't want to like send people the message like don't play this game not at all like play the game it's probably going to be really good just just be cautious, you know? Like, oh, yeah. I mean, make sure it's not, like, a watered-down, every-man's kind of product. Yeah. Okay, now, for the final question of this interview. Well, we've been actually going on quite a while. almost an, I think almost an hour and 30. Wow. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Where do you expect to be five years from now? Well, hopefully I'll be fucking done with the game by then. Uh, but probably <laughs> not. Um... Because, I, I, like I said, I'm going to go in a lot of wild places this game, and considering that I'm lazy as hell, I really hope that I'll at least be close to finish by then. Uh, but it's really hard to say for certain. I definitely will say that after No More Future is done, I want to keep working in this field. I want to keep writing. I have a lot of cool ideas for the ends. I even have a few ideas for, like, turn-based strategy, like, think Fire Emblem but furry uh, kind of ideas. Uh, which I hope eventually I'll be able to do. I'm exploring, I, I tried to explore the possibility of like my current uh, real world uh, like uh, employers, but sadly they're, it, 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 it's, it's not exactly the, the right place, you know, to talk about this stuff. They don't make exactly that kind of games. Um, it's how I got it explained to me. Um, and yeah, eventually, I do want, like, I, I think that as long as I hold fast to my to my dreams and keep working hard towards them and just keep improving, keep furthering myself as a person, keep opening myself up to new opportunities, um, eventually I'll have, an, I'll have the chance to make all my dreams reality. Um, until then, I just hope I'll, I'll stay true to this one. You know, I, I don't want to abandon them no more future midway through. Uh, I want to keep working on it and just keep delivering something that people will look forward to every month. You heard it here first, folks. No more future two. No more past. Confirmed for twenty seventy six. Uh, I don't think like like <laughs> no more future like is is part of this like timeline of stories that I want to write basically. But I'm not in, like I, I'm not usually a fan of like direct sequels or direct prequels. Like I'm usually just a uh, like a, a shared universe kind of person, you know. 
Yeah, that makes me just, that, just, that makes me think of what if uh, No More Future took place in the Dark Ages. <laughs> Call it ye, ye old synthetic. Oh, yeah. Well. No, go ahead. No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm done here. I'm okay, and, uh, nothing else you wanted to add? No. Okay, so before we wrap up this interview, this interview, is there anything you wanted to ask me? Um, well, kind of, I don't know. Um, You're in the hot seat! <laughs> I don't know if you explained it before when you were talking about, like, how you started creating YouTube videos, but, like, how do you really begin the entire channel, you know? Like, what's, what's caused you to try and become a YouTuber? Okay, so honestly, I got inspired back in the day by, surprise, surprise, Markiplier. I um, loved the old way of how, how he had his YouTube videos. He, it had very, my, he had very little editing. He, he just kind of jumped into doing Let's Plays. Um, he just, he, he had, it was kind of like a raw experience that I really connected with. Because I love, because I think in a lot of highly edited videos, you miss out on a little, a lot of these little moments with the creator that you wouldn't normally otherwise pick up on because they just get cut out on the cutting room floor and, and, and just uh, replaced with something that's, you know, just like more funny or, you know, oh, more casual. Because I think that when you keep, start heavily editing a lot of your videos and such, I think you lose a lot of those little moments that the audience will come to appreciate over time more. But yeah, that's what I tried to emulate with my channel when I first started off. I was just doing Let's Plays. In fact, one of the first games I did Let's Play of was Amnesia, The Dark Descent, one of my favorite games ever. But, uh, like, everyone and their mom, everyone and their mom was doing a, uh, was doing a gameplay channel at the time. So I decided to pivot and go in different directions. Um, I had started doing trailer reactions and stuff like that. I had a little bit of success with that, but it wasn't really what I wanted to do. So I just, one day, I just decided to start playing a visual novel to see how it worked out and as I said earlier well, the rest is history well that's nice at least I'm happy that uh, this fandom managed to impact you as much as it, me, as it did me yeah find your niche mm -hmm. but yeah guys I think that will actually wrap it up I know we've been going for quite a while I think you might be able to view this one as maybe almost like a podcast where you just put it on in the background and listen to it <laughs> Yeah, I think my musician Leslie kind of does that in the in the back. Like I, I I hear that he does the same thing with like your uh, with your regular videos, and he just puts them in the back room, like like when he's uh, doing gym stuff or whatever. Uh, I assume this one will go on for quite a while though, <laughs> several sessions in fact. Uh, oh, so, but, so he like, he listens to my he listens to my my uh, videos while he's at the gym. Uh, like I think he like does his own like. Uh, his own stuff at home basically um and he just puts it in the background while he does his uh does his uh, routine um, oh that's pretty cool i love it i love to hear of, that um, yeah uh, I've, I've always been a little bit skeptical of like your style of, of playing vi uh very visual novels because you're kind of just like going through them uh voice acting along the way and not adding too much basically as you go um which is like it's something that I always found a little strange because to me it just felt like at that point why don't I just go and read the, the actual novel you know um, but then he explained to me like the, that, he, that he listens to it while he while he does all the stuff in the background basically and I was like you know what that makes sense like at the end of the day uh, you are reading the story for those who can't read it for themselves like uh, in this way you're kind of like allowing them to enjoy a, 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 a niche that they wouldn't otherwise be able to enjoy because they just don't have time out of their day to read the stories for themselves, you know? So I think it's, I, I think you're doing a noble work, you know, in your own way, even though I can't fully appreciate it myself. No, that's fine. Yeah, I, I kind of, I love the idea of listening to stuff in the background while I'm doing something else because that's, that's what I do a lot. I'll just like pop my headphones in and just listen to like visual novel stuff like while I, or podcast while I do the dishes and that's kind of what I strive to be. I want to be a channel where you can actually watch it and follow along with it or you can just pop it, your pop your little ear pods in and listen along. But yeah. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, sorry. But yeah, did you have anything else for me? No, nah, not really. I'm thankful for the opportunity though. Sure, no problem. All right, guys. Well, that will conclude our interview with Sedge today. I want to thank him so much for joining me. Uh, Sedge, I know the audience loves you, loves your work. 
just don't give up. We love what you're doing. Keep doing it. We're always going to be here to support you. Sure. Thanks. And thank you, thank you again for coming on. I enjoyed having you. Uh, it's and it's been a hell of a game I've been playing. I love No More Future, and I can't wait to see more of it. Well, I'm happy to hear that. Hopefully, the new content will always be up to your expectations. I think it will be. You're doing good. You guys are doing good work. All right, guys. So thank you so much for listening. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, ring that notification bell. Leave a super thanks if you can. It always helps. And until the next video, I love you all. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye!